Welcome to The Gangster, book six in the Galactic Football League series. Written and performed by Scott Sigler, The Gangster is suitable for ages 12 and up and contains graphic violence. The Gangster is also available as a signed, numbered, limited edition hardcover while supplies last. To order, go to scottsigler.com slash store. junkies. I hope this episode finds you well. I hope you're enjoying this burgeoning summer that is breaking upon us like a cracked egg onto a skillet. I am over 72,000 words done with GFL book seven, second draft. It is moving along steadily, but some days are harder than others when it comes to the writing. We're definitely moving in the right direction. We're going to get that done and it's going to be great. In other updates, GFL Book 6, The Gangster Hardcover, is at the printer, as I've told you before. We do not yet have a shipping date, but the lion's share of the work is done. Now we just have to wait for the printer to kick it out. A and I are in the process of cleaning up the garage and the storage unit, getting ready for five giant pallets of girthy tomes. Now, we have spent months prepping for the shipping of The Gangster using full COVID protocols. And we're probably going to stick to that plan even as California opens up, which means that she and I, all by her lonesome, will be signing, packing, and shipping some 1,750 copies of The Gangster. It's a ton of work, but we are going to get it done. We're going to finally make this right for you guys. Let's get caught up on the story so far for The Gangster, and then we're all going to drag race down Main Street. Previously on The Gangster, Quentin sent Chalita Sackacorn, a doctor at the borehole, to con Greedock the Splithead into coming to the isolated prison. Greedock is on his way, but should Quentin stick with his plan for a non-lethal solution, or should he do the smart thing and kill Greedock? Find out what he decides next on The Gangster, episode number 29. Belief. The borehole facility was larger than Quentin had thought. 200 cells in total, 175 with occupants, inmates, and newly confined staff alike. So much space to be filled with enemies of the state. Add in medical facilities for the known species, living quarters, and recreational facilities for the staff, life support equipment, and all the connecting tunnels, and you had a self contained subterranean hive a place where sentience rights did not exist. Maybe other governments had similar dark places, maybe every government did for all Quentin knew, but he'd never been tortured in one of those. He'd been tortured here. The borehole fueled his hatred for the Craterakians. Quentin stood in the facility's control center, along with Killian and Aya. The room wasn't that big, but with a dozen workstations, all empty except for the one Aya sat at, it felt a bit empty. The room's main display marked three approaching ships, the Carcelero, its fighter escort flown by beans, and Greedox yacht, the Little Ruler. The Little Ruler was a model similar to the Hypatia, built for both comfort and speed. Aya and Killian wore prison guard uniforms, complete with gray armor and sidearm. Helmets sat in a counter by the door. Aya had put on some facial prosthetics and makeup. The disguise wasn't Federico quality, but if Quentin had casually passed her on the street, he wouldn't have recognized her. Killian, on the other hand, hadn't bothered with the disguise. Either he thought the helmet was enough, or he just didn't care. All three ships are 20 minutes out, Aya said. Tight beam message from the Carcelero. They have the case Quentin asked them to get. Richfield had come through. Another part of the plan had worked. Quentin felt a surge of excitement that he might really pull this off might end the threat of Greedock to Splithead without killing anyone. The little ruler is requesting permission to land, Aya said. Tight beam optical transmission using the primary authorization. Looks like Dr. Sackacorn is all right. Killing had given Sackacorn several authorization codes, each with a different connotation. One, the primary, to give if she and Greedock were aboard. Another one, if she was there but Greedock was not. A third she would have given to Greedock if he'd left her behind, and a fourth one for her to provide to the leader 
if she'd been forced to give it up under duress. Sackacorn had given the primary. Greedock was on the ship. It was happening. He fell for it, Killian said. Amazing. Quentin nodded. Hate can blind. And I have to be careful not to blind myself. Arrogance can blind as well, Killian said. Sounds like your boss has both. A touch over two full days since Quentin had been set free, and Greedock was here. Quentin still felt so weak. Food and sleep had helped, but he'd need a lot more of both before he was in decent shape. Aya, Killian said. Tell the little ruler to hold position while the carcelero docks in the shaft. I'll grab the case and put the two crew members back in their cell, then we'll be ready for Greedock. She nodded. Understood, Skipper. Wiggle your asses on out of here in case the little ruler wants to go visual. Killian gently gripped Quentin's elbow. Come on, the older man said. Time for you to go back to jail. They left Aya to her task. Let's go over the plan again, Quentin said as they walked. Killian didn't complain, even though they'd been over it dozens of times. Bean stays in the fighter while the little ruler docks, he said. Aya and I will meet Sackacorn, Greedock, and Greedock's guards at the airlock gate. Aya does the talking, plays it like we're in on the deal with Sackacorn. Aya will insist Greedock comes in alone. Which he will refuse, Quentin said. He'll tell Sackacorn the deal is off unless his bodyguards come with him. He'll be adamant, perfectly willing to walk away and take his money with him. I hope you know Greedock as well as you think you do. Quentin had learned how to study sentience, how to intimidate and manipulate, how to think five, six, seven moves ahead of his foes. All of those skills came courtesy of his long-running feud with the leader. Did Quentin know Greedock well? Yes, because Greedock had made Quentin who he now was. In effect, the leader was more of a father figure than Killian Carbonaro could ever be. I hope so too, Quentin said. Next? Sack of corn will give in. I will demand the bad guys check their weapons. Greedock will refuse, but I will be adamant. She'll also tell them we have a limited window of time to get this done. I'll collect any weapons they're carrying. Which Greedock will accept, Quentin said, perhaps just to hear the words again to test their logic. No one would be allowed to carry weapons into a prison. The facility scanners will find all weapons, Killian said. Still think that warrior will try to hide one? Virac, the one variable of this plan that Quentin couldn't be sure of. During Jonathan Sandoval's rampage, Quentin had saved Virac's life. Virac had struggled with that fact afterward, because had his and Quentin's roles been reversed, Virac would not have saved Quentin. The dichotomy disturbed the warrior. Quentin and Virac were on opposite sides of Greedock, one fighting to be free of the leader, the other doing anything the leader asked. And yet Quentin and Virac were also teammates, both starters for the INF Krakens. The warrior was one of the league's best linebackers. Off the field, Quentin and Virac despised each other. On the field, they were two pieces of the whole that had won a pair of GFL titles. It was no accident that Virac the Mean was a champion. His nature drove him to go all out at everything he did, on the gridiron or enforcing Greedock's will. He will absolutely try to hide a weapon, Quentin said. The sentience Greedock has working for him are bad news. Virac is the baddest of them all. He's a professional athlete, big, strong, and fast. He's a killer, even without weapons. Don't take your eyes off him, but don't hurt him if you can help it. You know we might not have a choice, Killian said. If my crew is in danger, I'll put him down. Quentin nodded. Hopefully, it wouldn't come to that. A choice something most warriors didn't have. They were genetically compelled to follow the orders of their leader, to protect their Shamakath at any cost. But that didn't change the fact that Virac was on one side of the struggle, while Quentin, and Killian and his crew, was on the other. I take their weapons, put them in a weapon storage locker by the gate, Killian said. They'll see me do that. It'll look logical and normal, like visiting any high-security facility. When we bring Greedock and his guards in, I quietly activate the borehole's internal comm jammers to make sure Greedock can't communicate with his yacht. Beans is monitoring that system. 
When it activates, he tight beam signals the Little Ruler pilot, informs the pilot of the missile lock. Little Ruler and anyone aboard are out of the fight. If the ship tries to do anything, boom, it's gone. Killian clearly enjoyed that part of the plan. The same missiles that had kept the Oleron frozen in place were now being used against someone who threatened his son. Then Beans can dock the fighter and come inside, Quentin said. He suits up in his schmeck and waits to back us up if needed. Beans and Killian had shown Quentin a big schmeck Beans used for situations like this. It was the newest of the Sklornos' creations, apparently. The furry little guy said he'd recently lost an even bigger schmeck, but Killian had shushed Beans on spilling the details. So many secrets among the Oleron crew. The new schmeck was a heavily armed, mismatched suit of homemade armor that looked like a drunken artist's rendition of an antique war machine. The rig turned Beans from a chest-sized ball of fur into an eight-foot-tall weapon. The Schmeck's torso, oddly, looked kind of like a small, beat-up refrigerator, which was weird. Don't forget it will take Beans time to dock, get inside, and get his Schmeck on, Killian said. Until he does. It's you, me, and Aya, and that's it. I know. You're sure she can handle this? She's so... Tiny? Killian nodded. Yeah, she is. She's also a good shot, and I've seen her operate under fire. She pulls her own weight. If she says she can handle this, I believe her. It wasn't like Quentin had much of a choice of personnel. Aya and Killian were the only ones who could pass for normal prison guards. Win or lose, Quentin had to do it with this team. Aya and I walk sack of corn, greet Ock and his goons to your cell, Killian said. When you're ready, you tap the transmitter that Beans put on your fingernail. Tap it once, Aya and I come back into the cell. Tap it twice, your restraints release. I and I will be armed, Greedock and his goons will not. This is the most dangerous part of leaving the guards alive. We have to get Greedock out fast before they have too much time to think. We take Greedock, leave his goons in the cell, we board the Oleron. I will program the cells holding prison staff to open after we're long gone. Then we wait for Greedock's transformation. Not an easy plan by any stretch, but it was the best they had on short notice. If all goes well, Quentin said, we wind up with Greedock, his goons will be released, and nobody gets hurt. Sackacorn could come with, or she could stay and find a way to quit her job without being implicated. She'd done her part. Quentin would make sure she got her money. What she did from there was her choice. Killian stopped walking. Quentin did as well. I have to be honest, Killian said. I've killed more sentience than I can even remember. I'm not proud of it, but if I've learned one thing in life, it's that death is permanent. Leaving your enemies alive can come back to haunt you in ways you can't always see coming. Costly ways. As much as I hate to admit it, the smart play here is to kill Greedock and his guards. Pain in the man's eyes. Saying those words tore him up. He was speaking from deep personal experience. Had he left an enemy alive? If so, at what cost? Killian was a life-taker. Was Quentin the same? The gun kicking in his hand. Jonathan Sandoval's head snapping back. The body falling to the floor. We're not killing anyone unless we have no choice, Quentin said. Greedock's guards aren't the reason I got tortured. He is. Killian sniffed, swallowed hard. Was he trying to hold back tears? The idea of a man his size, his obvious ferocity, a null knife, crying. Someday, Quentin wanted to hear all of the man's stories. Someday. For now, though, Quentin had to focus on the ordeal to come. A decision had to be made, and he was making it. I'll tell you again, Quentin said. Don't kill anyone unless you have absolutely no choice. Promise me. The smallest hint of a smile on Killian's mouth, the barest gleam of pride in his eyes. I promise. Quentin believed him. And this setup was your idea, Quentin said. Killing Greedock won't get me the information I need to be free. I need to know what he knows, what he told the Ministry of Religion about the schism meeting. The more he says when he thinks he's in control, the less I have to get out of him after. 
after Quentin forced him to take the Gibble Juants, which might wind up killing Greedock anyway. They walked on in silence until they reached the cell. His cell. Quentin looked through the open door into the hellhole of darkness that had claimed far more than just a few weeks of his life. On the floor in the center of the room, the same restraints he'd worn while he was a prisoner, the very same ones that had kept him from fighting back against the guards who beat him every day. He had to go in there. He had to put on those restraints. He would have to watch as the door closed, shutting off all light. And then he would have to wait. This'll work, he said, and heard the tremor in his words. This has to work. Killian put his hand on Quentin's shoulder. I'm here. I wasn't there for you before, but I am now. We will make this work. No matter what I need to do, I will see you through this. And Quentin believed that, too. He didn't know why he believed. He only knew that he did. He believed absolutely. Killian Carbonaro would be there, right to the bitter end. And that gave Quentin the strength he needed. He stripped off his clothes, handed them to his father, then stepped into the cell. Closing in. So close. So close to watching the worm crawl. Greedock, Chalita Sakakorn, and Masal the Efficient followed Gristlehead and Ru Ang Mip out of the airlock. Virak stayed a step behind Greedock, as always. A few meters down the narrow corridor was a white, curved arch. Obviously, a weapons detector. Just past the arch, two human prison guards, one big, one small, wearing gray body armor and helmets with mirrored visors. The big one carried a shotgun. The smaller held a pistol against her thigh. Both guards seemed tense, on edge. That's far enough, the small one said. A female, from the sound of her voice. Greedock stopped, as did his retinue. Send your guards back to the ship, the human female said. Only you get to come in, Greedock. There was a slightly darker gray rectangle on her left breast, where a name tag should have gone. She'd likely removed it for this event. The larger human, a man judging by his size, was also missing a name tag. My associates will accompany me, Greedock said. Sackacorn turned to him. You see, I told you to leave them on your yacht. You can't take your thugs with you. You have to understand that. This is a prison. Greedock met her gaze, stared at her for a few seconds before answering. Sackacorn's pulse had already skyrocketed. She smelled of fear, of tension. She was in a hurry. As I said, my associates will accompany me. Then the deal is off. Sackacorn's voice rose. You can't think you can take these, these gangsters into a prison. I promise to get you in, not your damn army. The deal remains, Greedock said. Unless these two nameless prison guards are going to shoot my associates and me, which I imagine will make for a difficult situation for you, we will not move from this spot. If you wish to expedite the situation, then I suggest you take me and my associates to Barnes. Immediately. Sackacorn's lip curled and her face flushed red, betraying her anger. Greedock, come on, she said. You have to understand... Chalita. It was the man talking, his voice deep and gruff. We don't have time for this. Sackacorn turned even redder, her anger now directed at the man. Just as Greedock had suspected, the doctor and her co-conspirators had a limited amount of time to complete this business. The man had just handed Greedock a bargaining chip, and Sackacorn knew it. She looked at Masal, then Gristlehead, then Ru Eng Mip, then at Virak, and finally at Greedock. You can take your assistant, she said, and one of your bodyguards, one of them. Greedock waited a beat, enjoying her discomfort. He twitched an antenna. Masal took a step forward. The safety of the wise and benevolent Greedock the Splithead is of the utmost importance, the worker said. We are, after all, in a facility populated by violent antisocial individuals. Greedock, 
has already compromised. He left his pilot aboard his ship. That seems a fair effort on Greedock's part. The Lee Key pilot was not a fighter by any stretch, but Massal made it sound like quite the sacrifice. Sacacorn trembled with anger. Chalita, the mail guard said. Are we doing this or not? You're going to get us busted. Greedock knew he'd never heard that man's voice before, but there was something oddly familiar about it. He couldn't place it. There was no mistaking the urgency in that voice, however. The male human was about to call this off. I will not pay Sakakorn until I see Barnes, Greedock said to him. If I do not see Barnes, she does not get paid, which means you do not get paid. Although I imagine that if we all stand here long enough, a staff member will come along who is not part of your operation, at which point not getting paid will be the least of your concerns. Greedock was playing a dangerous hunch. For all he knew, Sackacorn and the two prison guards knew how to dispose of bodies with no one being the wiser. Possible, but doubtful. This was a target of opportunity for Sackacorn, possibly the first time she'd tried sneaking someone into the prison. Greedock wasn't really the one at risk here. Sackacorn was. We have a limited amount of time before the next shift shows up, the female guard said. We need to move right now. Five is a lot, but we'll handle it. Sackacorn glared at the woman, then at Greedock. Fine, the doctor said. Masal and your bodyguards can come. Greedock affected a human bow. How kind of you, Chalita. Weapons, the female guard said, pointing to a plastic bin on the floor just before the weapons detector. The man with the shotgun leveled it at Greedock. And don't try hiding anything, the man said. After the scanner, I'll manually search each of you. Trust me when I say I'd rather figure out how to vent your bodies into space without getting caught than let you in here with a weapon. His words rang of desperation and with truth. This man had killed before. Greedock could sense it. The man would do it again if he felt he had no choice. Something so tantalizingly familiar about the man's voice. Greedock dismissed the thought. He had never heard this particular human's voice before, and knowing that was enough. It was risky to be completely unarmed, but a facility like this would have more weapon scanners further in. Hiding anything would only slow the process down. Byrak, Gristlehead, Rueng, Greedock said. Weapons in the bin. Gristlehead and Rueng Mip obeyed immediately, placing handguns and knives into the bin. Virak drew his pistol from the holster at the small of his back, but did not drop it in with the rest. The warrior glanced back at Greedock. Shamagath, going in unarmed is a mistake. Disrespect and disobedience. Not only in front of other underlings, but also in the presence of strangers? Intolerable. Virak had simply not been the same since the Sandoval attack. It was time for a change, but that time was not now. Greedock allowed the smallest curl of black to slither and curl across his cornea, here then gone in a flash. Invisible to most, a klaxon shout to a warrior or a worker. Virak hesitated a moment longer, then dropped his pistol into the bin. The female guard pointed at Greedock, curled her finger inward. You first, she said, through the scanner. Virak bristled, started to move toward her, but Greedock had had enough of the warrior thinking he knew best. Stay where you are, Greedock said to him. I will go first. The leader strode forward, leaving his bodyguards behind. If time was truly of the essence, he didn't want to waste a moment of his chance to see Quentin Barnes grovel. Greedock stepped through the detector. No alarm sounded. He stared up at the human female, her face hidden behind her mirrored visor. Watch them, the female guard said. Greedock, I have to pat you down. The human male aimed his shotgun at Gristlehead and the others. Arms up, Greedock, the female said. He spread his middle and pedipalp arms to the side. She patted him down, checked his bracelets and necklaces, then stepped back, pointed to a spot against the wall. Over there, she said. Greedock complied. 
The female guard aimed her pistol at Greedock, then waved for Gristlehead to walk through the weapon scanner. The message was clear. If any of the guards tried anything, Greedock would be the first to die. The big Sklorna walked through the detector. The male guard searched her as Greedock waited, growing more impatient by the second. You have been listening to The Gangster, book six in the Galactic Football League series, written and narrated by Scott Ziegler. Follow Scott on Instagram and Twitter, where he is at Scott Ziegler, one word, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Scott Ziegler. For more information on the Galactic Football League series and for more free audiobook podcasts, visit scottsigler.com. The Gangster was directed by A. Sigler, engineered by Steve Rickyberg. Copyright 2020, Empty Set Entertainment. Theme music is the song They're Watching Me by the band Super Weapon. 